building up solo means we need to be ruthless with our time. We're not building for enterprise. We're building apps that can be maintained by an individual engineer. And that advice is completely different to what you typically hear. Hey guys, my name is Warren. I've been a software engineer for over 14 years. In this video, we'll cover the complete tech stack to build up solo including language, framework, authentication, database, and where to actually host those apps. So stick around to the end and we'll cover all of that in complete detail. Now, when we look at all of our tech stack requirements, we're gonna be looking at what's best for a solo engineer. Just a single person working on a project, doing all of the engineering, the marketing, and everything in between. So all of the advice here is geared towards that type of system. This advice is not geared towards startups or enterprises, so this is probably not the kind of video you wanna watch if you need advice on those topics. Now, it all starts with the language that we choose. And typically, I would advise that you should pick the language that you're most comfortable with, not the language that is the best tool for the job. The reason is that as solo founders, we're trying to move as quickly as possible. And if you're trying to learn a new language or something that you're not familiar with every time you start a new project, you're just never gonna to get to production. Of course, there are some restrictions based on what you're building. For example, anything web-based, you have to use JavaScript in that case. But personally, what I would go with is anything web or mobile-based, I use TypeScript or just JavaScript. The reason being, it's one language across the full stack, backend and frontend, and means that I can just keep everything inside one repository. This is really nice to be able to move quickly, deploy everything together. That doesn't mean that I can't implement a serverless architecture, for example. It just means everything's in one place. There's no cognitive overload about deploying separate applications. I can just change code in one repository, do a git push, and then suddenly all of my code, server and client, is on production. Now, the framework you choose, if you do choose one, will be dictated by the language that you've chosen as well. For JavaScript and TypeScript and anything React-based, the typical framework would be Next.js. The reason being that the ecosystem here is fantastic and it's really easy to find answers to any problems that you have. Next.js is of course really well maintained and backed by a huge company being Vercel. I'll typically avoid using brand new products or very small tools because getting that support even from things like ChatGPT is gonna be far more difficult if there's less data about it on the internet. So for full stack apps, choose platforms like Next.js. For web and mobile, I'd still stick to TypeScript and JavaScript go with React Native and then build with a platform like Expo. If you are building with Expo, they now have something called Expo Application Services, which is a way to deploy your apps to the App Store through all of their build tools. Now, I worked on React Native like eight years ago, and that was kind of before Expo was a real decent thing. And it was so difficult to develop and deploy apps with React Native back then. But coming back to it for the first time now, the developer experience has been so nice with Expo and not having to set up all of the framework around building your app has been a really nice experience. And you just don't have to think about all of that stuff that you shouldn't really have to care about right now. For front-end only apps like Chrome extensions, typically I would just build in React. Use a decent build tool like Rollup or Vite and then just go with that. Don't try and overcomplicate things that don't need to be complicated. Now, whether you actually use a framework or not, it's completely up to you, the problems you're trying to solve and how quickly you want to solve them. Of course, if you want all of this server-side rendering and advanced cache mechanisms that are available in things like Next.js, don't try and roll your own solution if it's just quicker to get it out of the box. We're trying to get to MVP as quickly as possible. But depending on the type of application that we're building, you could just build without a framework completely. Peter Levels, for example, notoriously just builds in plain PHP and he's making a huge amount of money per month on applications like that. But that's mainly because those are the tools that he's most comfortable with. So follow suit and choose things that you're most comfortable with and can get to production quickly. Now, I want to talk about authentication as well, because that's an entire beast in itself. And many of these SaaS platforms will try to convince you that authentication is really hard and you need to use their tools. But that is just completely false. It's really easy these days to use open source packages or OAuth providers to provide authentication to your users really quickly. So if you're using frameworks like Next.js, for example, there's packages like NextAuth that can just plug into Next.js and provide a really nice authentication system for your users. I would also highly recommend a way from doing username, password login, just because there's a load of maintenance around that with the forgotten password, the reset password flows. You need to set up an email provider as well to plug all that stuff in. So use a platform like NextAuth, only use OAuth providers like Google, Facebook, Twitter, for example. And that means that you can offload all of the responsibility around account management to those OAuth providers. I have actually tried platforms like Auth0 and I've actually found that it takes way longer to implement with them than just rolling your own solution. 
with an open source package. So don't be convinced that authentication is hard. Just use a popular package, integrate with OAuth providers, and you'll be pretty sweet on that one. Database is a pretty interesting one, and a lot of people have opinions on this. Back in the day, I used to love NoSQL databases like MongoDB, but as time went on, I started to realize that there was no sufficiently complex application that I could build that didn't require a SQL database or a relational database. So I ended up switching over to Postgres. That is the most popular and well-supported SQL database on the market today. And there's pretty much no problem you can't throw at it that Postgres can't solve. Typically, as solo founders, we're trying to reduce the infrastructure burden on us. And Postgres can actually be used as many other things than just a typical relational database. It's great for storing blobs of JSON, for example, so you can use it as a NoSQL database if you want. You can use it as a queuing system. It can even be used as a vector database with plugins like PG Vector. There are also many third party hosting platforms that treat Postgres as a first class citizen. Platforms like Heroku, for example, have first class support for Postgres and also open source platforms like Superbase as well. So to keep the architecture simple, I would opt for platforms like Postgres instead of trying to create a sort of mixed solution with MongoDB, Postgres and any other kind of database that can be solved in the meantime with just a single solution. It may not always be the best or the most efficient solution, but we're just trying to reduce the cognitive burden as much as possible. Now, when it comes to hosting solutions, there's a lot available to us, but the first piece of advice is do not host as a solo founder on platforms like AWS. We don't wanna get bogged down with all of the config and all of the maintenance involved with setting up Terraform and automatic deployments on AWS. Just use a SaaS platform like Heroku, Netlify, Versal, Superbase. These, as a single entity or a combination, can solve all of our problems and then we offload all of that maintenance, all of that DevOps stuff to those platforms for a really minimal fee. Of course, costs can increase as you start to get traffic more quickly than it would on just base AWS, but that's not a problem right now. Our problem is getting our first 10, 20, 100 customers. And at that small user base, the cost of these platforms is still gonna be really, really low. So for static web hosting, use a platform like Netlify. If you want database authentication and functions, platforms like Superbase are fantastic. If you want persistent servers, then Heroku is still a really great choice. And I know Heroku is like a bit of a boomer platform now, but back in the day, like 10 years ago, it was so innovative compared to all of the pre-existing solutions at that time. And many of the other platforms have really caught up now. So Heroku isn't quite as special anymore but it's still a pretty good one that covers a huge amount of requirements. Let's look at this comparison table, for example, just to see what's supported across all of the different hosting providers. So we've got all of the platforms on the left here, and then across the top, we've got all of the requirements that we might have, always on servers, built-in database, static hosting, serverless functions, and background workers. Now, if you look at the chart, Heroku is one of the only platforms that supports pretty much everything we need other than serverless functions which can be offloaded to always on servers. So Heroku has this concept of dynos, which are basically always on servers running on AWS. It has built-in databases, first-class support for things like Postgres, Redis, and a bunch of other things provided through their plugin ecosystem. You can also statically host files on Heroku through build packs. As I mentioned, serverless is not supported, but we do have background workers as well. Now, coming down to more of the popular platforms like Versal, for example, there's no always on servers. As far as I'm aware, they did support Postgres at one point, but they've actually phased that out and now recommend using other tools like Superbase. So there's no native support for databases. It has fantastic static hosting, serverless functions, and you can do background workers, but these aren't long running background tasks. These are just functions that you can execute at any point by calling the API endpoint. If you do want long running background workers, you need to use a third party tool or something like Heroku. Superbase is another fantastic tool, but it doesn't support always on servers. It's sort of a database first tool. So if you want really fantastic Postgres support, then Superbase is a really good one. It also has built in functions and a built in authentication provider. So this is actually a really nice one to use if you don't want to handle authentication at all. You can just sort of turn on the providers inside Superbase and then use their client code to authenticate your user with Superbase. That will automatically integrate with your Postgres database and everything's just set up. I've been building a React Native app recently. I'm actually using Superbase as the authentication provider for that. So users can log in with Apple. Again, background workers are supported, but this is just through serverless functions. Now, another popular one here, Netlify. Again, no always on servers, no built-in database, really good static hosting. 
and really good support for serverless functions and again background workers through background functions so you can see that heroku covers a lot of requirements so if i was you i would just host everything on just heroku or use a combination of platforms my choice is always Netlify with Superbase at the moment. Now just be aware though, if you're building a system on serverless functions, cold starts are gonna be a major problem. So if you have website visitors that need to see mission critical information, that requires a function to execute, that response time is gonna be way quicker on platforms like Heroku because the server is always on, rather than having to warm up a serverless function before finally returning a request to your user. In fact, I deployed an application last year that had this exact problem. So I deployed it once to Netlify with serverless functions and then again to Heroku and check out the difference in response time for the exact same application, no code changes on the two platforms. Now, as I mentioned before, just try to limit as much as possible the introduction of new infrastructure. If you can use an existing tool to solve your problem, maybe not in the perfect way, but at least to reduce the cognitive and maintenance overhead of introducing new infrastructure, then that is typically the way to go as a solo founder. So to wrap it up, my preferred tech stack is TypeScript with React, a framework like Next.js if I'm doing web, Expo with React Native if it's on mobile, and then for hosting, I'll use a combination of either Heroku or Netlify with Superbase. And then pretty much every application I work on is backed by a Postgres database. But thanks for watching guys. If you've got a completely different tech stack, then let's talk about it in the comments. I'd love to see what everyone else is using. But if you like this video, please give it a comment, like, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next one.